So um, I'm just going to start by saying a little bit about the uh, the Pemberton series, um, and um, uh, essentially the the lecture series is in honour of Professor John Pemberton, uh, who was an epidemiologist um, working in the field of social and preventative medicine, and he was a much loved uh, colleague uh, in Shah. And in uh, the early 30s, when he was a, a medical student at University College London. Um, he joined fellow students to organize the first aid and relief for the Jarrow hunger marches. Um, and um, he went on to write an article about malnutrition in England, and in that time linking malnutrition to unemployment. But obviously malnutrition is not, uh, is not a problem that's entirely uh, gone away, unfortunately. He was also a co-founder of the International Epidemiological Association, which is the sort of premier international epidemiological uh, uh, conference each year. And he also set up the Society for Social Medicine. Um, so he was a huge figure uh, in the field. And he continued to have a very active interest in public health long after uh, retirement, including uh, regular attendance at our uh, seminar series, where we always benefited from his wisdom and his long experience, uh, particularly as a practitioner, even before the NHS uh, came into being. Uh, and unfortunately, he passed away in 2010 at the ripe age of uh, 97. I'm delighted to say that we have Richard Pemberton uh, with us uh, in the audience uh, today. Now, we've had a, a Pemberton lecture uh, every year, just about every year since uh, 2010, uh, and I'm delighted uh, to introduce our, uh, our, our ninth speaker, um, Yvonne Coghill. Now, Yvonne um, started nursing, uh, nurse training at Central Middlesex Hospital in 1977, and qualified uh, as a general nurse in 1980, and then went on to qualify as uh, a men in mental health nursing and health visiting. Uh, in 1986, she secured her first NHS management job, and has since held a number of operational strategic leadership posts. In 2004, she was appointed as the Department of, uh, the Department of Health as private secretary to the then chief uh, executive of the NHS, Sir Nigel Crisp. Just to give you an idea of how, uh, how uh, highly she's held, she's been voted by colleagues in the NHS as one of the top most inspirational women, one of the top 50 most inspirational nurse leaders, and one of the top 50 BMME BMN pioneers. Uh, and in December 2017, she was included in the Health Service Journal's top influential uh, leaders. Yvonne has been awarded an OBE for services to healthcare and was appointed to the position of Director for Workforce Race Equality Standard Implementation in June 2015. Uh, and she's gone on to be awarded a fellowship at the Royal College of Nursing, a CBE, uh, and an honorary fellowship at King's College uh, University. Um, and um, uh, she uh, became Deputy President of uh, the Royal College of Nursing uh, in January 2019. So, uh, her, the choice of Yvonne to be our Pemberton lecturer uh, this year came with huge amount of support from uh, across um, Shah, uh, including both our past and outgoing um, Director of uh, Equality, Diversity and Inclusion, Rachel O'Hara, and also our, our new uh, Director, Fiona Sampson. And I'm also very grateful to Jeremy Dawson, who, uh, first, who suggested her uh, Yvonne in the first place and helped uh, set this up. So, with no further ado, I'll happily hand over now to Yvonne Coghill, who's going to talk on uh, why race equality in the NHS uh, is important. Okay, over to you, Yvonne. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, John, for, for that wonderful welcome. And thank you to everybody who's giving up their time to actually listen to me speak this afternoon. Uh, I was saying earlier that... Uh, uh, Sheffield is one of the places in the country that I really enjoy visiting and hopefully when all this madness is over I'll be able to visit uh, Sheffield again. So I will go straight into my talk uh, to talk about uh, race equality but I, I really cannot start my talk without mentioning these people and you will all know who they are. Um, uh, Barack Obama, uh, Michelle Obama of course and uh, we have now uh, Kamala Harris, who is in the White House. And the reason I mention these people, not just because they are fantastic and fabulous role models for people of color like myself, but because people believe that 
once people like this are in the White House, that race inequality has disappeared. But actually, if you think about Barack and Michelle Obama and the four years since they left the White House to last week when Kamala came in, you will know very well that uh, things are not quite what they might seem. Um, just because you have one or two people in senior level positions doesn't necessarily mean that race quality across the globe has gone away. Um, but I, I felt I needed to, to mention this uh, before I started an, into my talk. So, the NHS is the institution that we all know and love. Um, it's been around for a very, very long time, since 1948. I'm not going to rehearse that for you. But the NHS is an organization that has an objective. And the objective is to make sure that everybody, regardless of their background, has high quality patient care, patient safety, patient satisfaction, that we treat everybody regardless of their gender, their race, their disability, their age, exactly the same, that they get a really good service from people in the NHS. And, and indeed, this is part of our constitution. So if you open the document that talks about the NHS constitution, the first principle constitution, is that we make sure that we treat everybody well and that everybody gets high quality service from the NHS. Now, in order for us to do that, we have to make sure that our staff are well treated. I think that that is the, the key thing about the first principle of the NHS constitution. And at the same time, being the biggest organization in Europe, the biggest employer in Europe, one of the biggest organizations in the world, we have a wider public sector equality duty to make sure that we promote equality, that we're seen to be an equal opportunities employer, that we are an organization that people that can people can look look up to and say, yes, the NHS is doing this very, very well. So actually maybe we ought to think about doing well as well. Um, and, and that's why I always show the first principle of the NHS constitution when I'm doing my talks, because this is what we're all about. This is what we're here for, to make sure that everybody gets high quality service uh, from the NHS. Um, John has already mentioned uh, Jeremy uh, Dawson, and um, I will probably mention Jeremy a few times during my talk, but it's really important uh, that that he is mentioned because i would i would say that without the work of michael west and jeremy dawson to be honest i don't know how much further the nhs would be with regards to race equality and the reason i'm saying that is that back in 2009 they did a piece of work um and i remember getting the document and the document was called nhs quality and staff engagement and it was, I think it was on page 12 or something of that document. I read something that I had never read before in, in all of the time I had been in the NHS. There was a lot of anecdotal evidence about the fact that people of colour, people from black and minority ethnic backgrounds, uh, were having a difficult time in the NHS. But people would do that and say, oh, no, maybe, you know what, it's, it's just the way uh, you feel and maybe you're imagining it and maybe you've got a chip on your shoulder, all that kind of thing. We didn't have hard, hard evidence to say, actually, there is a real issue. So when this document came out and I read this, I, I thought, my goodness gracious me, everything's going to change immediately <clears throat> because people are going to read this and understand and know that by treating your uh, staff from non-white backgrounds well, it means that patients are going to get a high quality service from the system. And actually, I mean, the words that are written here are exactly as they're written in that document. You know, the greater proportion of staff from a black or minority ethnic background who re report experiencing discrimination at work in the previous 12 months, the lower the levels of patient satisfaction. And that was like music to my ears for somebody who was working in race equality, because I supposed, I imagined that other people reading that would think, OK, and we need to do something about race. We need to make uh, um, some interventions here. We're going to make sure that everybody is treated fairly and well. And indeed, it went on to say, the experience of black minority ethnic staff or non-white staff is a very good barometer of the climate of respect and care for all within NHS trusts. Really, for me, strong words, and I think for others, it gave us a platform to work from to actually say there is an issue here. 
this is something that we really need to look at because it's not just about you know those black folks over there wanting higher level positions this is about patient care and patient safety this is about the satisfaction our patients get from actually having a, having a an intervention in the nhs and i think that that was where it really started for me in terms of understanding and knowing that there was a link direct link between how staff felt how they um, were treated and how patients got their care. So I think it was a really, really important thing for me. On top of that, we also had uh, a piece of work that was done by Sir Robert Francis, and many of you will remember this. Sir Robert Francis was brought in to actually look at the uh, issues around Mid-Staffordshire Hospital. And Mid-Staffordshire Hospitals Trust had a lot of problems at the time, and people were, were losing their lives, and it was really very unpleasant. What he found was was equally interesting uh, and he actually wasn't even looking for this what he found was that non-white staff um, in the workplace were saying that actually they were not going to speak up for fear of being victimized victimized by management they would rather not say anything if they saw something going wrong with patients for fear that they would be victimized they would lose their jobs and things would uh, be uncomfortable for them. Now, this is really important because if you are a clinician or a member of staff in the NHS and you see something going wrong, it is your duty to actually speak up because ultimately this is about patient care and making sure that our patients are safe. And if you see something and you feel so frightened that you can't speak up, you can't say anything, you're paralyzed because you feel, oh my goodness, this is going to be awful for me personally, then um, that really does make a difference to the quality of care that patients are getting. So this information, along with the information that Jeremy and Michael did, actually was saying something very, very clear to lots of people about our NHS. And at that time, I remember clearly, because I was in a job where I was training, developing and supporting black and ethnic minority staff to, um, to be, be better, uh, as it were, to be able to function uh, like their white colleagues function, uh, something that we now call the deficit model. We were trying to change them so that they would be more acceptable to the system. When, when actually the issue is much, much bigger and much broader than that. But I bring this in because I think this is really important in, in terms of healthcare and making the link between high quality patient care and a well uh, valued, cared for and motivated workforce. Uh, very important stuff. And so benefits of race equality and having equity within our system are very, very clear. And I think uh, most people will, will know them. And again, I, I call on, on, on Jeremy's work uh, and Michael's work uh, for some of this, because in the NHS, the evidence base is what matters. Everybody wants the evidence around everything. Well, you know, prove it, Yvonne. You know, you're saying that this is something that happens and give us the evidence for that. So we know that fairness and equality in the system is the right thing to do. Everybody, I don't think there's anybody who would say that morally it isn't the right thing to make sure that you treat everybody the same. And you'd be hard pressed to find somebody that would say, oh, no, 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 we have to treat some people better than others. And we also know that it is you know, part of our public sector equality duty. But again, the most important things, I believe, are the fact we know that for every one standard deviation point of increased engagement within an organization an acute hospital it means there will be 2.4 less people dying which is, is which is quite a substantial number of people when you think of all the organizations we have nearly 300 provider organizations in our in our country as well as that on top of that you will save money um, and 150 thousand pounds is, is, is quite a lot of money in organizations and actually I think it's actually more than that now if I recall rightly. But the point is that if people feel that they're engaged and they're part of something, if they feel that they are valued, if they feel that you know people are going to respect them and treat them with dignity, it means that they're not going to go off sick. It means that they're not going to leave the organization. It means that, that you know the cost to, to pay for uh, bank and agency staff are reduced and it also means that patient care and patient safety uh, is, is actually increased and improved. So 
benefits of race equality aren't just about there being a moral case and actually promoting a few people of colour over here and, and over there. There's a hard, hard business case within the NHS for making sure it stacks up for every single person, uh, regardless of their background. So I think that's really, really clear and I think people know that. So let's get to talking about this thing called uh, race inequality, uh, which we all know is a, is a global channel challenge. You know, race inequality has been with us for the last 400 years or so, and we know it started because uh, it was an economic reason for categorizing people and putting some people into uh, the bucket of not as good as other people. And we also know that today, in 2020, we have uh, evidence across the globe that people from non backgrounds that live in white majority countries have poorer life chances and life experiences than their white counterparts. And, and that's not fair and it's not right and it's not equitable, but actually that's the way it is. And that's the way it is today in 2020. You, know, you get, uh, in terms of health, um, and I will talk a little bit later on about, about COVID, um, you know, wealth, housing, education, um, you know, employment, judiciary, across the board, if you have more melanin in your skin, uh, you have uh, a poorer experience of life generally than your white counterparts. And it's a really interesting thing because obviously if you come from a white background, it's very, very, very difficult for you to understand and, and know that and experience that because a lot of these experiences that people of colour have are, are invisible to people who are not from those backgrounds. So it's a really um, interesting thing, but it is a fact that we have a hierarchy in our, in our world of what's worthy, what is good, what does good look like, and invariably it doesn't look like a lot of people who are from black um, Asian or minority ethnic backgrounds. So I think it's really important that we, we know that. And we have so much data that actually shows this. Uh, and I have so much of it, but I haven't got the time to show you all of it. But this is just a, a slide that shows you um, about mortality and you know life expectancy in various countries, New Zealand, Australia, Canada, United States. And you can see here that if you are an indigenous person from Australia, your life expectancy is, is, is really quite poor compared to your white counterparts. These are the types of things that people of colour know across the world. So we, we, we understand and we know that. Um, we also know in this country, and this is relatively recent data, that you, know, you are more likely to lose your life uh, giving birth than um, if you are you know, if you're from a black background, then if you are some from a white background, for example, interestingly enough, if you're from a Chinese background, it looks as if you have a, a better experience uh, according to the Embrace data. But I think you probably uh, think there. And also, in terms of income, um, for every pound that you know, the white majority uh, population earns, you can see very clearly that people from different backgrounds are making much less money 79 for other whites I suppose Eastern European people and uh, for Indians 86 Pakistanis 57 and so on I think it's really interesting and, and we will go back to the breaking down of ethnicities a little bit later on because we talk about this great big homogenous group of BAME people uh, <coughs> or BME people but actually within that there are very very different groups of people who are treated very, very differently by people in society. And here you can see at the very bottom of the pile are people uh, who are from Africa, black Africans making much less money than anybody else compared to you know, their white counterparts. So this data isn't old data. You know, we're looking at data that's not relatively, relatively uh, new data. This is still happening, and this is still where we are in our world uh, today. Now, this is a slide that I thought you would uh, find interesting, uh, and this is uh, this is this is up to date data of Res Indicator Seven. And I'll talk to you about the Res Indicators a little bit later on. The Res Indicators came into being back in 2015. And the job was to measure the difference in experience between black, uh, black and minority ethnic staff and, and, and white staff. But 
what Owen, the wonderful Owen Chinimbiri, who is the analyst um, in the Res team, has done is he's broken that down into into ethnicities, and across the board you can see what's happening here. That if you are very much like the money, if you are from a black background um, and you are black Africa, particularly your experience of equal opportunities or what you're saying uh, in terms of the equal opportunities that you feel that you're having in the NHS is much worse than everybody else is. And there's a sliding scale, there's a hierarchy in our NHS based on ethnicity. And this is not, this is just one slide. We have similar similar picture in a document that was done back in ooh, 2000 and I think it was 2012-13 um, looking at called um, uh, I think it was called uh, Making the Difference, which actually shows very clearly that if you are from a black background, actually you have a worse experience in our NHS than if you come from any other background. So when we say this BAME thing that, that people keep saying and, and calling, you know, BME and BAME and all the rest of it, what it, what it hides is that some groups within that uh, one homogenous group of BAME actually have a much worse experience in our NHS than other groups. Um, and what we have to start doing now is actually looking at people by ethnicity and not uh, having this great big one, uh, great, great, great big BAME thing that goes on. You can tell that I don't like it, don't you? Um, so racism, what is it? Racism um, is, an, is a really interesting thing. And this um, definition comes from the wonderful uh, Professor David Williams. Uh, who I work quite closely with uh, at Harvard University. And this is what he says it is. And I think it, it works incredibly well. It's an organized and well and a very sophisticated system. And I think it's an incredibly sophisticated and robust system. Um, it's a system that's lasted over 400 years. It works incredibly well by itself. You don't have to do very anything very much. It feeds itself. And actually, if you start to break it down, it will actually work really hard to make itself more robust again. Um, so it's a very, very strong system that categorizes ranks and devalues, disempowers and differentially allocates opportunities and resources. And it, 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 and it, as I say, it works incredibly well. And the, def the development of racism is undergirded by an ideology of inferiority, that some people are more inferior than others, that some people are worth more than others, <clears throat> excuse me, and that some people actually uh, deserve to be in high level positions based on the color of their skin, as opposed to other people who are not. And this leads to people um, treating people uh, differently. So there are in groups and out groups, and that differential treatment is called discrimination. And people are discriminated by individuals but also by institutions. And I think it's really important that people understand that because I think that nowadays particularly, um, individual racism is, is rarer than the systemic um, racism that we have within uh, lots of organizations. And it's not just the NHS because the system is designed and built to give us perfectly what we have got. So I think that that's, that's really important to know. And this discrimination is pervasive. It's, it's everywhere. And, you know, when you are a person of color, you feel it, you see it. So recently, you know, I was um, looking to buy property in Derbyshire. Um, and it's an interesting thing, um, going and buying a property out of London. Because in London, you have 50 percent 50, 50 people from colour and 50 percent white people. So, you know, people are used to uh, seeing people like me walking around and being part of the community. Going to a place like Derbyshire um, and looking for a property out in the countryside was an extremely, it was an interesting experience for me uh, in that. I felt um, personally, oh my goodness, these are the thoughts that are going through my head. Will they accept me? Are they going to sell their house to me? Are they going to be okay about my family being here? All of those thoughts that you don't really have if you are from a white background, because actually you can go anywhere in the country and be accepted and people will, you know, uh, uh, acknowledge you and so on. 
but the energy that it took for me to actually go to look for a house um, because I felt, uh, and it was my feeling, that potentially people would not want me to live in their area based on the colour of my skin, actually took a lot of uh, energy out of me. And generally receiving poorer services. I mean, I can tell you stories of being on the train and uh, people, the, the woman with the trolley just walking past me and not, not stopping to offer me a drink or anything like that. Poorer services generally, harder to access health care, you know, being stopped by the police more often than others, harsher sentences and on and on and on it goes. And these things happen and they are real and they do impact on people's lives and do impact on, on how people feel about themselves, but also how they feel about society and being in society. And some of you will have uh, read the work of Arlie Geronimus, who, who is a, a sociologist, an American sociologist, and she did a lot of work in America on um, what a thing called biological weathering. And, you know, when I read biological weathering, I thought, yeah, crikey, that, 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 that works. Because chronological age doesn't only capture the length of time you've been alive, it captures the experiences that you've had in that time. And what she found with her work was that uh, a lot of people from black backgrounds were uh, exposed to you know psychological social physical and chemical stressors in their environments where they work and so on and so forth and what she found was compared to white people black people were having higher levels of exposure to these stressors thus they were actually living uh, on average seven years shorter than their white counterparts uh, and she described it uh, and it's all very technical and scientific, and I'm not really a scientist, but uh, talking about the telomeres um, and the sequence of telomeres at the end of the chromosomes being shortened so that actually at the same chronological age, black women had accelerated biological aging of about seven years, which is, which is fascinating, actually, um, and, and horrible at the same time, um, based on the fact that you are constantly in this... Uh, state of, of, of stress um, because of the things that are happening to you in your life. And what was even more interesting about her work was that she found that uh, black women, because it was mostly black uh, people that she did this work on in America, black women who were uh, middle class black women uh, who you would think, you know, had, um, had bought their way out of, of poverty. They were living in nice houses, driving nice cars and so on and so forth. Actually, this thing still happened to them. It wasn't about their socioeconomic uh, environment or the amount of money they were making. It was about the amount of stress that they were under as a consequence of having to be probably the only black person or, you know, ethnic person in a world of, uh, of white people where they had to perform like white people, causing them much more uh, in terms of stress. That was really, really interesting that she, um, she found that. And of course, all of these things, all of these microaggressions and stressors, and people will know what, they, what they're like, it, 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 they're, they're fascinating. And, you know, when you sit in a room of people of color, they will come up with all sorts of, of new and interesting ones that they will tell you that has happened to them. Um, and they're tiring, you know, people saying to you, well, which country are you from and when are you going back? And the fact that you were you know, born here and you're parents were born here and your parents before that might have been born here you know people wanting to touch your hair people wanting to you know just making you feel different and other um and and, and it really it, it does impact on you and who you are and what you're able to do and what you're able to produce as an individual in society so I think it's really important that people understand these things because people will say well actually it's just banter you know we, we don't really mean it it's just something you know we're just we're just messing around we're not really serious about that you know but actually these things have they have impact um, and they actually have impact on people in quite quite a quite a, a substantial way because not only do people think about you know actually experience the, um, the microaggressions the thing that happened to me which was going to buy the house in in the Derbyshire was this thing called heightened vigilance where you are in a state of increased alertness which means that 
you, your your fight, flight or fight hormones are really raised and there are cortisols flushing around your body all the time. And actually, we know that those hormones are there because actually they are there for a reason for you to fight or flight. If those hormones are there consistently, constantly, because actually you're worried about, you know, what are they going to say? Can I walk into that pub? Is it going to be OK? Are they going to treat me well if I walk into this room or if, if I go here? I'm the only person here. If I say something, are people going to all of those thoughts that go through your head? And what um, Dr. Lisa Cooper, uh, who I actually had the pleasure of meeting when I was at John Hopkins in uh, Baltimore, uh, said in her work, was that a preoccupation with race amongst blacks leads to hypervigilance, a heightened awareness of their stigmatized status in society, and a feeling that they have to constantly watch their backs. Now, uh, it, it, it might be a feeling uh, for some, but it is the reality for others. Um, and, you know, as people of color, I would say, I'm, I'm one of them myself, you know, we do have this uh, preoccupation about whether or not we are going to be stigmatized by society. Is it going to be okay for us? Is it going to be all right? And as a consequence of that, that impacts on you physiologically, as I've already described, as well as psychologically. You can see the damage that racism does to people just by living their lives in, in society and how difficult it is. And that chronic stress, it really does wreak havoc with your mind and your body um, because of the, the adrenaline and the cortisone and so on and so forth. It leads to increased blood pressure and its associated problems. And this is a really interesting thing, I think, because, you know, uh, since we've had COVID, we've had lots of people talking about, well, uh, disproportionately people of colour are actually getting the, the disease and, and dying. Heart disease, diabetes, mental health problems, sleep problems and weight gain are all things that happen as a consequence of chronic stress. And these are things that happen to lots of people. So we know that, you know, people, we, we say, trips off the tongue, people from South Asia are more likely to have diabetes, people from the Caribbean are more likely to have hypertension. But actually, is it just about socioeconomic um, uh, circumstances that they're living in? Or is it to do with something else as well? Um, because what happens then is that your body becomes uh, immunocompromised. If you're sick, you know, heart disease, diabetes, sleep problems uh, and I was talking to Dr Williams about uh, about sleep problems and he he said there's a study and I haven't got the the um, the details of the study here but I can I can find them that the people of color actually do not sleep as well as their white counterparts our bodies do not rest because that hyper vigilance thing means that we are still in a state even when we're sleeping of actually anxiety, which is really, really quite an interesting one. And I will, I will look up uh, the references on that because I think that's a really interesting one. And so is it any surprise to anybody that there is disproportionate impact on non-white communities from COVID-19? And it's not something that we're talking about very much on the news. People are saying, oh, we've done pieces of research and it's people living in houses of multiple occupancy and it's people with comorbidities and it's people with this and that. Nobody is talking about the fact that actually if you're living in a society that isn't conducive to you, uh, isn't actually built for you, that maybe, just maybe, that is causing you this chronic stress and that might be what's making you immunocompromised and potentially more susceptible to, um, to COVID. Um, and it's some of the work that really, really needs to be done. But of course, if you start to saying these things that it's really quite um it's quite damning and something really needs to be done so i can understand why politically we are where we are and uh it's it's just i find it very fascinating in my talks these days i i always always show this picture and this picture um came to me probably in july this year um, and some of you would have seen it already. But I, I think it's really important that we remember that these people that have passed have lost their lives, all, all NHS workers, doctors and nurses, some of them are healthcare assistants, some of them are cleaners. These people have given their lives to the health service um, and none of them expected to go to work, to get COVID and to die. And I think it's really important that we remember these people as people 
uh, as individuals, with families, with friends, with um, you know, with lives of their own, and remember, you know, that they have been working, they have worked incredibly hard, and we know that we've lost over 600 um, colleagues in the NHS from COVID, um, and we're going into phase two. Um, stage two or the second lockdown or the second phase of COVID um, and people are worried and people are anxious and, and rightly so but it's just so that we have just a, just a few seconds on this armistice day to think about our colleagues that we have lost uh, from COVID. So back to the discrimination in our NHS. Uh, this is a really interesting slide which which shows you know very very clearly that um, if you are from um, a black and ethnic minority background, the thing that you actually talk about and say that you, you, you feel is that you're discriminated against. And this shows very clearly that you're discriminated against much more than uh, any other protected characteristic. But what also is fascinating about this uh, slide is that it, uh, it's flatlined. So all of the interventions that we've put into the NHS over the last five years haven't really made that much of a difference in terms of people um, feeling that they are having a good experience in our NHS. Um, and in fact, you can see by the top line that for some people it's actually got worse. So I think that it's really, it's, it's, an, it's an interesting uh, slide and that discrimination is, is alive and kicking and very much within our NHS. Um, as, as at the moment, um, I, I think it's a really sobering picture of the service that should be treating all of the, our staff the same because actually treating our staff the same means that we will have high quality patient care uh, and patient safety and so on. And the consequences for our staff are these. And it's really interesting because people say, well, you know, you know, the angry black woman thing, which is by the way me um you know, why are you you know why are you full of rage why are you angry the, the anger the rage is is about the unfairness of it all you know the system is stacked against you and you know that and it really is very very difficult you you know you become disillusioned i mean personally i was going to leave the nhs and go and do something else somewhere else and i was very lucky that uh, i was picked up by uh, sir nigel crisp who actually had some belief belief in me which was fantastic you know, there's a, a, an, an unhappiness, there's a lack of belief in the system. And ultimately, if you're not cared for, it's very, very difficult for you to care for other people. And so that resentment sex sets in, that, you know, lack of belief in the system and, and, and mistrust and so on. These are the consequences for people when our, uh, the system isn't working very well for them and they know that the system isn't working uh, very well for them. And I think that that is, is it's really important that people understand and know that in order to get where we need to go, this, is, this has to change. It has to change. The NHS, as I said, was a, is a very uh, diverse organisation and I show this slide just to, just to make my point again about the number of people we have working in the NHS and, and how many we have from long backgrounds. You know, the numbers of doctors that we have and nurses that we have from non-white backgrounds. And in fact, um, I heard recently that, you know, one in four uh, of our nurses are from um, ethnic background now, um, as opposed to one in five a few years ago. Um, so, you know, people of colour are coming into the NHS and working in the NHS to make sure it all stacks up. But when you look at the figures, at the other side of the slide, it has to make you wonder. It has to. Because if there are so many people of colour working in our NHS, um, how is it then that in 2020 we only have nine non-white chief executives out of 227, 225 trusts, but also all of our arms length bodies, all of our CCGs, you know, nearly 500 organisations. You have to ask yourself what the issue is there, as well as, you know, the numbers of chairs that we have. Um, executive directors of nursing, medical directors, and so on. It, 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 it says very clearly that we have an issue in our NHS of valuing some people 
and actually valuing some people more than we value others. So I think it's really a, a very, very powerful and interesting slide. And so that's why we came to the Workforce Race Equality Standard. And the Workforce Race Equality Standard, as some of you know, is about measuring the difference in experience between people of, uh, from ethnic groups and, and white uh, members of staff. And we've been doing that for five years. So we've got five years worth of data showing us very, very clearly that the experience that people have from black uh, and uh, Asian and minority ethnic backgrounds uh, is very, very different from the experience of people from white backgrounds. Um, and, you know, what we've been trying to do is to close the gap on that experience so that people uh, feel that they're more valued, more appreciated, so that they actually are able to deliver better and higher quality care. Um, and over the last five years, we have managed to start close the gap on what we call the process indicators, which are things like, you know, appointment from shortlisting, it's better now than it was in 2015, uh, fewer people go through the formal disciplinary processes. But as you saw from one of the slides that I showed, uh, showed you earlier, the cultural, the feel of how does it feel around here hasn't, hasn't changed very much at all. Uh, people still feel very much that uh, the organisation is, um, is, is not is not for them, it's not conducive. So I think that that is something that we really do have to think about uh, going forward because it's a really very difficult and, and, and tricky um, uh, situation for the, for the, RC, uh, for the NHS to be in. Uh, some slides just showing you uh, very, very quickly the difference for staff from all backgrounds. And you can see here very clearly that uh, you know, people from um, non-white backgrounds actually don't think they're getting as good uh, career opportunities as other people. Uh, this is the one that really freaks me out. It's the one about have you personally experienced discrimination at work from any of the following? And this is your this is managers actually. Um, and it's 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 not it's not a pretty picture. It's not a good picture. So there's work that needs to be done supporting and helping the system to be better than it is. And we've been working incredibly hard uh, in the res team to, to get to a place where we can understand and know what we need to do uh, around race equality. And earlier this year, um, I actually came up with this. Um, and actually, it's taken off in the NHS and people really, really like it. This is about allyship, because without having white support, uh, our white senior leaders, our white colleagues support this agenda it's never going to get anywhere. You're never going to make a difference unless people who are in senior level positions, and the majority of them are from white backgrounds, actually say, well, actually, we have to do something about this. And we have to work on this to make a difference for all of our staff so that ultimately we make a difference for all of our patients. And, you know, I came up with the seven A's of authentic allyship because people kept on asking me and saying to me, well, Yvonne, you know, it's all well and good, you're giving us all this bad news. What is it that you, we need, you need us to do? What do we do in order to be better and to make things better? And, and this, I think, works very well. And it works very well, not just for race. It works incredibly well for other protected characteristics. Because the first thing that people have to do is to ask themselves, do I actually have the appetite to do this? Do I actually have the appetite to immerse myself in the complex world and the emotive world of race equality? Am I going to do that? Because people have said to me, you know, well, you know, if I had enough of this ring, you know, why can't we just talk about something else now? Or why can't we, you know, look at something else? And, and they can do that, definitely, because they're not living the lives of people of color. If you are going to be an authentic ally, you have to have the appetite to stay the course and to be a supportive ally going forward. So ask yourself that question before you actually say, yes, I am an ally. Are you going to be a genuine, authentic ally? You then have to ask yourself some questions. You have to ask yourself whether or not, you know, you are um, going to understand, know, learn, educate yourself. You really have to find out whether or not you're, you're willing to do that. And that's, I think probably that's the easiest bit because there's so much data and information out there about you know, 
race equality and you know where it started and how people feel and all the rest of it so uh, the ask is an easy one the acceptance is the third uh, the third a and that is where you actually have to acknowledge that there is a problem and that's uh, for some people really difficult because people can't see it they can't feel it and i sometimes uh, liken it to when i walk past people who are from homeless backgrounds and i and i see it and i think to myself my goodness that's awful and that's terrible uh, and then i walk away and i and i it goes from my head what has to happen is that you have to accept that there is a huge huge problem uh, of race inequality and then acknowledge it externally that is actually saying, yeah, I get that there is a problem and I'm, I'm, I'm going to be part of the solution. And that's where you actually start to say to people, I'm really sorry that this is happening to you um, and I'm going to do everything in my power to help support you. Sixth A is not assuming that you know the answer. A lot of the time people you know, will put things into place that they believe will work. Um, and things that are not evidence-based, things that, um, for example, I don't know, unconscious bias training or uh, let's do some reverse mentoring or whatever it is. And actually, they put those things into, into place and they don't change the system. So before acting, which is the seventh day, you actually have to understand that what you're going to put into place will work. And I've been told that people are, are using this model to actually work with a lot of their um, white staff um, as well as others to to actually talk about and think about what authentic allyship is and what it what it what it means. Working with Dr. Williams in uh, in Harvard, it was really quite interesting because I I actually said to him, "Will anything work? Is there anything that will make a difference around race equality? Because that's the most important thing, really. It's all well and good having all the data and knowing how terrible and dreadful it is, but actually, what works? And the key thing, the key thing that works is um, Leadership. Leadership is absolutely the key thing. You need to have people who are willing to stand up, put their hands up and say, yes, 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 I'm going to support this and actually be accountable as well as collecting the data and having all of that information. It's really important that we we have those leaders who will support and help and lead on this. I heard Joe Biden the other day uh, talking about one of his top priorities was going to be race equality. I mean, he actually said it, um, uh, the leader of the, the free world, as it were, talking about the fact that there needs to be changes around race equality in his country and, and saying that we're going to do something about this. It, that's so powerful and it means so much. The communications part is also key. It's really important that we, we drip, drip, drip the communications into our system, into society, that you know, race equality is a good thing. We are living through a time when um, we are saying the opposite and we are shutting up shop in terms of our country when we don't want to have these different people coming into our country to take our jobs and our houses and all the rest of it. And actually, you know, people are coming here to pay taxes, to make the lives of other people better, to make their lives better. And we have to drip, drip, drip feed into a society that actually... This is a good thing, um, but actually what we have is a situation in our society where there's a kind of a, a disconnect of people saying, no, it's not a good thing. We have to start saying louder and clearer that it is. And we need to have some resources around this. In my time uh, working in the NHS, there has been very, very little investment in, in, in this work, in, into what works around race equality. I'm happy to say that Simon Stevens has now invested quite heavily in the new uh, Health and Race Observatory, which is a new organisation that's headed, headed up by um, uh, Dr. Habib Nakvi, looking at what is it we really need to do to improve the health of our uh, non-white populations. What can we do, an evidence base, that will make a real difference? Because it's no good throwing good money after bad and doing what we've always done to get the results that we've always got. We've got to do things differently. So as well as doing all of that, um, I think that the, the, the important thing is that we also have operational interventions as well as cultural transformation really important that we do all of this and Dr Williams said you have to do it over a period of five years minimum to get some changes in uh, in 
in your organization and ultimately in society. So it's not a quick fix. Uh, changing people's attitudes, their beliefs and their behaviors is not, is not easy. It's not a quick fix. And sometimes, um, yesterday I was talking to uh, one of the ministers uh, along with colleagues um, and they were looking for something that would happen very, very, very quickly. The issue is it, it won't change very quickly. And what we have to do is to get people to understand that the changing people's behaviours will take time. And if you can't change their behaviours, you have to put systems into place to make them do the right thing. So there's something about carrot and there's something about stick as well. Uh, and I think finally, uh, say, uh, I've just recently uh, completed a piece of work in London um, doing the race equality standard, uh, where race equality uh, strategy for London, a piece of work that I'm really, really proud of. And what I'd have to say is that uh, a group of people came together to talk about what it should feel like in the NHS if uh, you know everything was fair and equitable. And I absolutely love this quote, which Janelle James, an inclusion manager, put together from the world. Should be more senior decision makers who look like me, who make choices that don't disadvantage me and my future. Leaders who don't look like me would be understanding, authentic, and committed to inclusion through their actions and how they speak. My difference would be valued. It would be a buzzing place to work. Everyone would feel uplifted and part of a shared vision to deliver high quality patient care. And I think that, that says it all, really, to, to, to be honest. Um, so thank you. Uh, thank you very much for, for listening. Great. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Yvonne. That was uh, fantastic. Um, you know, describing the importance of the problem, the nature of the problem, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, showing the evidence of the problem. Uh, and, um, and really, <laughs> frustratingly, the lack of progress, obviously, uh, over many years, uh, and uh, and then presenting some some sort of challenges at the end for how we can can address these things. So that's that's been absolutely fantastic. Um, Thank you. So thanks very much uh, for that excellent uh, overview. What um, is now uh, we're going to do is obviously start to address some of the questions that are starting to ping up on on screen here. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, some of them are quite long. I'd ask people if you could keep the questions very short, because obviously we haven't got time to read lengthy questions. Um, that would be really, uh, really helpful. Um, but um, I'd like to put to you first, if that's okay, the first question from uh, Usman Malik, um, where he says, Hi, Yvonne, what can be done by the NHS as an organisation to give the WRES initiative the boost it now needs to allow there to be significant and sustainable change moving forward uh, and they'd like to ask directly so that's good. hello everyone Hope hi well. how are you <laughs> nice to see you well i can't see you but nice to hear you <laughs> i'm actually on holiday believe me or not but i thought i'd jump in just to hear you speak so that's good oh thank you bless you <laughs> yeah, it's always a pleasure um I just wanted to know, with all the all, all the changes that have happened now, uh, what 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 do you think the NHS can do as an organisation to give the Res Initiative essentially the boost in our needs to to allow the change to be significant and sustainable? Yeah, and and I I I I think that the NHS, because you will know as well as I I do, that it is a an organisation that uh, um, is. Um, what's the word for it, it's hierarchical. And so what we have is Simon Stevens at the top of the organisation who is very, very keen to make sure that race equality stays uh, stays high profile, which is why they have invested so heavily in the new Health and Race Observatory. My feeling is that the Health and Race Observatory is going to be the new thing <laughs> um, in terms of race equality uh, in, the NA, in the NHS because what we are able to do is to collect the evidence base to give back to the NHS to say, actually, this is what works, this is what you should do, this is how you should go about doing it. Um, and so that's going to be happening in the not too distant future. Um, I, I know that we're going to be going through a period of, of change. And what we're aiming to do is to be involved in that change so that we can actually 
deeply embed uh, race equality into some of the system's levers. Um, and I'm saying we because um, Habib has asked, kindly asked me to work with him uh, at the new Health and Race Observatory. So I, I think there's a really good future for race equality within the NHS, providing people don't get fed up with it, because already I'm hearing that people are saying we've had enough of this race equality stuff. When are we going to start talking about other things? So, you know, it's keeping it alive and keeping it, you know, fo keeping people focused. Thank you. Take care. Thank Enjoy you. the rest of your day. <laughs> Thank you. Um, right. Um, if you're ready, we now have a question from Candice Majewski, uh, who's asked me to read it out. She says, okay. everyone, thank you so much for this really informative talk. As someone who isn't working in the NHS, I wonder whether you could comment on anything you would like to see us do as patients to help uh, push uh, more for more progress? Oh gosh, that's a really that's a really good thing, a really good question because patients need to to speak up and say exactly how they're experiencing the service. So you know, patient groups and uh, the the public generally are incredibly powerful when they say something. Politicians sit up and listen; they they, they hear it because obviously they're the, they're the electorate. So having people who are experiencing the service, um, talking about you know, the, the service that they're getting, whether it's good, bad or indifferent, and saying that actually we need to be doing things in a way that is equitable, it, it would pay dividends, it would be fantastic. Um, and you can do that in many, many ways. You can do that by writing. Uh, to your organization you can do that by joining patient groups um, and and talking to you know senior staff and other people so it's there's lots of ways of um, of helping to, uh, the the work around race equality um, it's by it's being an ally you know it's it's being an ally and understanding that people are not necessarily getting the same services um, uh, and the same treatment as other people so it, it's it's making sure that you're aware of that and actually speaking up and saying something about it so yes please do um, I, actually I just add to that there's something called carer opinion um, which is something where you can go if you go to carer opinion you can make comments about your experience uh, as a patient or as a service user um, so that's a good place as well and a lot of trusts I know uh, use that uh, quite for feedback um, so uh, right we have uh, another question which um, I think the uh, from Jackie Long who said she's happy for me to read this out so um, what can we this is similar in a way what can we do as researchers what we research we do sorry I missed that what can we do sorry yeah what can we do as researchers uh -huh. what research would, re would you really like to see happening that can help to change things Oh wow! God, that's a that's a really good question. At the moment, there, there is um, uh, we're looking at research around around COVID, um, and particularly the thing that I was talking about, um, which was we we imagine that the that COVID is as a consequence of people living in um, in comorbid co co cohabiting. It's not cohabiting. It's um, houses with multiple occupancy. It's also people who have comorbidities. And all that kind of thing but actually we haven't got as much data in this country about the effects of discrimination on people's health it, we really genuinely haven't we've got lots of american studies and i showed some american studies and so on but actually there is something about what is really going on in this country and having that that data and that research that would be fantastic the other thing that we need really quickly on as researchers we need to understand sooner rather than later why it is that fewer people of color want to take up the vaccine uh, that is going to be on, off, on offer shortly and their white counterparts. A piece of work that's come out of the London School of Tropical Medicine, um, uh, yes, a London School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene has shown very clearly that one in uh, you know, three out of four people um, from black and ethnic minority backgrounds would think twice about taking a vaccine um, and that's I think that's that's going to cause 
some issues and some problems and some difficulties going forward if that's what people think and people believe and what we don't know is why people think that uh, I have some ideas as to why they might think that but this is what they what this, which is this is something that's being shown at the moment we're going into a time where people are going to have to take the vaccine and if we've got groups of the population who are vulnerable who won't take the vaccine then I think we're in trouble so we really do need to think about that right yeah good point <laughs> Um, we have a question from your, um, well, from a colleague, from your colleague, Jeremy Dawson. Um, <laughs> I wonder if we could unmute Jeremy so he can ask his question. Better not be anything hard, Jeremy, because I usually come to you to answer the hard questions. <laughs> Hi, Yvonne. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Hi, Jeremy. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for that. Really, really interesting. Um, some of which I'd heard before, some of it which is new stuff, which was uh, really fascinating. Um, and obviously, you talked almost, uh, well, mostly about the NHS, but yeah. we're all working in academia where we also have problems. And I'm wondering if there's anything in particular from uh, what you've said today that you think universities can learn. Yeah. I mean, I think I think it would be brilliant if we had a, a, a res for universities, don't you, Jeremy, where we actually collected up the data across all of our universities and actually had a look at it uh, just to start with. Just let's do the data to begin with, because I'm not sure that we have that. Do we have that across the board in all of our universities in terms of, you know, starting with well, where black staff are and where white staff are? And then asking some of those those questions that we ask in the NHS uh, from our staff survey. Um, wouldn't it be interesting to see what the results were? I mean, I think you and I probably know what the answers are, um, will be. And then, and then maybe starting from there with a view to actually closing the gap um, that we have in the, in the NHS. I know that some organisations that are not in the NHS are looking to do the workforce race equality standard. Um, and they're looking to do, to do the thing that we did, which is to get the data, look at the data and start closing the gap on the experiences. But what I think the five years of the, the um, res has shown us is that those process indicators are easy to check, to change and manage. But it's the culture of organizations that are is, is the, is the tricky bit. And that means changing people that are sitting at the top of organizations, their minds, their views, their feelings about all of this and getting them to start um thinking about how they could make the changes that need to be made um i don't know it, it's 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 a tricky one but i think that universities would be a fantastic place to do it because many of your students ha happen to look like me as opposed to looking <laughs> so it would be a really really good place um to start great thank you we could do it, we could do it together jeremy <laughs> 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 Thanks very much. And uh, yeah, I, I, I certainly took note of some of the comments you were making towards the end about the role that leadership uh, of an organisation has to play. Uh, in yeah. um, right, so we have a question which I've been asked to read out for Matthew Burnham. Um, hi Yvonne, I'd like to know what your experience of unconscious bias training is and whether you've found this has been an effective in changing practice. Uh, this is an interesting one because we've had um, unconscious bias training at the university for a number of years, you know, uh, and it, it's, in a sense, has been sold, obviously, as a way of uh, tackling some of the problems that you've raised. But yes, I can see yeah. from your... Uh, you, 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 you know, <laughs> I, meant, I mentioned it in my talk as being one of the things that uh, doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't change culture and it doesn't change structures and systems at all. Um, it's, it's a nice thing to do. And if you go to some unconscious bias training sessions, it, you know, it's good fun. And they talk about, you know, we've all, we've all got unconscious bias and we all, you know, like what we like and we choose what we like and all the rest of it. Yes. And that's great and fine and dandy. And they tell you that, you know, when you're interviewing people, you need to try to keep it at the front of your mind that you might decide to choose the things that you people that you are most uh, associated with and all the rest of it it doesn't change anything a jot we've had unconscious bias training going around the system for the last 10 years and it, it doesn't change systems it doesn't it's very much like um, reverse mentoring which is a nice thing it's a lovely thing to do and people understand it and it, but it doesn't change it doesn't change systems and processes um, so I, I, I think the thing that has to happen is the thing that, that you know, the, the circles that I had with Dr. Williams, um, his, 
his uh, interventions where you actually have to do things where you know the leaders have to start saying this is something that we're going to do and mean it you have to have you know uh, accountability you know in the NHS we've got the CQC we need to actually start turning the screws to make sure that people are actually going to be delivering on work for um, on workforce race and that they actually feel it if they don't you know that there will be consequences if you don't we need to have up to date and, and good data we need to build this into all of our system leader levers just doing a couple of unconscious bias training sessions just will not do it and you, you know usually with uh, with race equality as well we have these um, EDI equality diversity inclusion sessions on online and you pick a box and you've done it and technically you're supposed to be uh, EDI aware it, it, it just doesn't work so I would say uh, you know save your money and do something else <laughs> With it because I mean people have actually bought wonderful houses in the Caribbean on the back of the unconscious price trading that their organizations have uh, delivered across not only health but everywhere so yeah um, I'm not a fan clearly <laughs> okay. interesting what you say about uh, houses in the Caribbean on the back of it um, right <laughs> so, uh, just another question which I've been asked to read out from Abby Wilson I, I think it's more of a statement and it, it probably sounds like yeah. it's Sort of an agreement with what you've been saying, but basically, most organizations, including ONH, uh, does consider race equality inclusion from economic benefits point of view. Should we not begin to start considering it from the fairness point of view? Yeah, we, I, yeah, absolutely, but it doesn't work, unfortunately. <laughs> with, uh, with, with, with race equality, there's a massive empathy gap, people don't really care that much about it, you know. It's uh, it's kind of like, oh, whereas if you have somebody who is visibly uh, disabled or something like that, there is there is empathy. People can feel really sorry for them. Um, and there is this thing about, you know, oh, God, this is so tiresome and boring. We've been doing, we've been at this race thing for such a long time. Um, can't we focus on something else? And then the other protected characteristics, people are sort of, um, well, we've talked about race a long time. Why can't we talk about this instead? So there's this empathy gap, and I think that it is really, really tricky to get organizations to start thinking about fairness and equity, and the way we're, we're trying to get them to, to move to where we need them to move is to say this is, there's, this, is a, this is a business imperative. This is about patient care, patient safety. This is about patients, um, as opposed to it being about the staff. It is about the staff as well. You don't get as much buy-in if you, if you talk about that as you would if you talk about patients. So... Yes, it would be nice to have a night have it, you know, it's a moral thing to do, but unfortunately we don't live in that world, I'm afraid. Sorry. Okay. Thanks so much. Uh we now have a question from Nicola J. Um and I wonder if um Nicola would like to ask the question directly. Yeah, and I'm gonna turn the light on. Yeah. You're doing very well by the way. Let me know when you've um uh when you're uh, feel like you've had enough questions. <laughs> There's plenty oh, no, more. That's fine. <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> okay, that's good. Uh, do we? Oh, yeah, we have Nicola J as, pres as presenter. Good. Do you want to uh, unmute yourself, Nicola? Okay. Mm. Hi. Hi. Hi, and thank you so much. I've heard you talk a couple of times, and each time um, I get even more from the presentation, so thank you. One of the thank things you. that I struggle with is that this constant kind of iteration that we, and don't take this the wrong way, but that we, we treat people exactly the same because I think that works for the disadvantage of people. And I mm. wonder whether everyone deserves the same outcome, everyone deserves to achieve the same, everyone deserves to be given the same opportunities. But because mm. of everything that you've just stated in your presentation, mm. that means that I think we need to make a bigger effort for different mm. groups. And actually yeah. by saying that we treat people the same, we work to the advantage of those people who are biased because they say, well, we're having the same. You know, it's yeah. not my fault that actually they're not doing X, Y, and Z because they're getting the same as everybody else. So I just wonder if we must sometimes need to change the language that we're using to help yeah. different people in different groups. 
No, I absolutely agree, Nicola. And usually I show a slide at the end where, where you have all these people standing on boxes. And you've probably seen it before. Um, and, you know, if you have all the boxes at the same level and different people of different heights, they're going to have a different outcome, you know. And uh, so we talk about, I talk about equity now as opposed to equality because people say things like, well, I treat everyone the same. If you treat everybody the same, you're going to get a different outcome because everybody's coming from a different place. So it is about equity. It is about putting systems and processes into place, like the Workforce Race Equality Standard, to help groups of people who are not um, in the same position as other people. So, you know, a black female or a Muslim female, for example, is definitely not in the same place as a white middle class woman, for example. They're not coming from the same place. So you have to do things differently for groups of people for them to get to. I absolutely agree with you 100%. And starting to use the language of equity as opposed to the language of equality is, is where it's at, really, because a lot of people get very confused and say, you know, I'm, I'm treating everybody equally. I'm treating everybody the same. But actually, if you treat everybody the same, you're going to get different outcomes. And we're looking at the outcomes as opposed to the treatment. So, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. Great. Thanks very much. Um, we now have a question from Helena. Would you would you like to ask your question directly? That's Helena. Oh, well, she's left the session. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, a question was, um, I wonder if we should be introducing some of these issues on CQC. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm not reading it out very well. But it's yeah. around CQC that she's asking. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. I mean, she's left the session. But, you know, we've been trying to, to um, uh, squeeze our arm around the, uh, the CQC and squeeze it a little bit more uh, to get what we need out of the CQC. Because the NHS believes in the CQC and, and chief execs and others really do hold store by their ratings they they do so if they get a good or an outstanding rating it's fantastic so built within the well-led domain is something on um on race equality they they have to inspect and ask you know how what's it like around here look at the the res data and so on the issue is that even if you get poor uh, uh scores on on race it doesn't necessarily impact or affect the rest of your cqc score um, so you could have a really shocking res result. You can still become an outstanding trust, and we think that that's wrong, and we don't think that that's right because of the work that you know the the, the statement that I showed at the beginning of the the, the session, where Jeremy and Michael had said that, you know um, you can tell whether a trust is good or not, and whether it's a, there's a spiral of positivity and an outstanding trust and all the rest of it by the feelings of your black and ethnic minority staff. So the question then is, well, how come that you're getting outstanding if actually, you know, a substantial number of your staff are saying this organization is terrible. Um, the CQC said it's to do with the, the way that they, you know, the model that they use and you know, they put things into a calculator, I suppose, and the answer comes out the other end. But actually, we're trying our best to get them to start to change that because it's it, it's just not right. It doesn't feel right that you're going to get outstanding when a lot of your staff are thinking, you know, saying this is, this is terrible and this is awful. So yeah, there's work to be done on that. And Helena, Helena didn't hear the answer to the question because she's gone. I did, I did. <laughs> with my internet. Uh, but thank oh, you. That's you're very welcome. I hope you heard you heard most of it. We're still trying to work on that to make sure that that we we get that into place because it really is a very important lever for us to use to make yeah. uh, make changes in the system. Sure. Thank you, everyone. You're welcome. <laughs> Right. Uh, we now have a question from Richard Pemberton um, uh, that's COVID related. I um, oh. wondered if we could get Richard um, to ask that directly as well. Hi, it's Richard speaking. I don't know how to do the video. Oh, yeah. Um, right. Oh, hi, Yvonne. Can you Hello, can Richard. You? Hi. Hi. Um, great talk. Um, it feels like, and you referenced this, that COVID shone a very kind of bright but tragic light on 
the impact of race inequality. Mm. And I wonder, and, and also it kind of, this has happened at the same as, time as Black Lives Matter. Mm. It feels like there's something possibly of a tipping point. And I wonder if the, the recovery and all the changes that are coming into the NHS as a result of COVID, whether this is an opportunity to give the agendas that you've been pursuing kind of a, a, another huge shove. I don't know what you think about that. I, 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 I do you know what, Richard? Rich, I hope so. I mean, I really hope so. Uh, during the summer when we had Black Lives Matter uh, issue and people were pulling down statues and doing all sorts of things, there was this, there was this window of opportunity, I felt, that, you know, mm -hmm. people were beginning to really, really get it and really understand it. Um, I think the window's closed a bit. And we're not talking so much about George Floyd and, you know, taking the, you know, knee on the neck and all the rest of it. It's closed a bit. But I still I still think that there is an opportunity because more people now understand about race inequality than did six months ago because it was all over the news and, and so on and so forth. And, and we also have many more people wanting to make those changes as well. I think that uh, we we now have a, I don't want to get too political, but we now have the leader of the free world who is much more switched on to um, race equality um, than we had even a week ago. Um, so so that's, that's helpful as well. And I think that going forward, it's going to take some time to get to where we, we, we want to be. But I think we're in a better place than we were this time last year around people's understanding and knowledge of race inequality. We also have uh, in our, in our um, and it was supposed to come out today, actually, but I haven't seen it as yet, um, the uh, Joint Select Committee on Race was going to be putting something out about what should be done with all of the reports that have come in during COVID. So Doreen Lawrence, something from PHE, you know, and other people have put made recommendations on race equality. And what they are now recommending is that we need to have some really strong actions linked to those recommendations. Whether that happens or not, Richard, I mm. don't know. But we ha we're in a place where I think that if we have people like yourself, you know, and John and others really saying, yeah, we need to do something now. I think that we can get much further down the road. I'm not going to be overly optimistic, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. Great. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Richard. Um, Thank you. Now we, we have another question from Bo. Um, Bo, <laughs> would you like to ask your question directly? Yes, Bo, ask me the question directly. <laughs> trying to unmute I think it's BE Luke I think we're looking for BE okay I'm just having trouble finding uh, on the list okay okay we'll, we'll go on to Clara Mercuria uh, while we look for, for look for Bo um, so, uh, Clara, um, I see you've asked a question. Would you like Would you like to ask the question directly? Yes. Thanks. Thanks for your talk, Yvonne. Um, my question hi, was hi. hi, hi. My question was really um, based on your experience uh, working in the in the NHS and all the work you've been involved in. Um, what progress has there been in on race equality? And what are your expectations, I guess, going forward? I mean, you, you, you kind of alluded to that in your last comments where you can sound very hopeful, but... <laughs> yeah. But, uh, so, yeah, so, so I, I, I was working in the, I've been, I was working in the NHS for 43 years. Um, and the data that I showed you in terms of the numbers of people of colour in senior level positions um, was derisory. There was like, you know, a handful of nurses, a few managers and so on. And that was over 43 years to get to that point, really, <laughs> to be fair. Um, so if you're asking me, do I think it's going to change overnight? No, it's not. And actually, I said that when I was leaving the NHS and they put it in the HSJ and everybody beat me up and said, oh, well, what was she doing sitting there for five years doing nothing if it's not going to change in the next 10 years? Well, it's taken 400 years for us to get here, hasn't it? 
happens to us. That's how long it's taken us to get to where we are. We're not going to change this thing overnight. We're not going to change the people who really don't want race equality overnight. It's going to take time and it's going to take our white allies to really begin to get it and understand it and to do something about it along with us. So am I hopeful? Yes. Am I going to see the changes that I want to see in my lifetime? Probably not. I'm being honest, probably not in my lifetime. I will see some changes because I've seen some changes already. I was brought up in the 60s when it was permissible to call people all sorts of names and to you have things on the TV like the black and white milk minstrels and you had uh, your love thy neighbor and all the rest of it. That's changed. Very, very different. But it needs to change again and change some more. So probably within the next 50 years or so. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. I don't know. What do you think? What do you think? I, I don't know. I, I was asking the question because um, you you showed that slide at the beginning with you know Barack Obama and you know Kamala Harris. Um, but obviously, as you you know, the, the Obamas had eight years, and and then but nothing changed. In fact, things seemed to get worse. So I had this thought. Well. Have you seen experience on a smaller scale, like the NHS? It's not like a country where they've got a lot more to address. Because, in a sense, I would like to be hopeful and think, you know, yeah, because I, 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 I am, I am hopeful. I am hopeful. Yeah. I, but I'm, what I'm trying to do is temp, uh, is try to to manage people's expectations because okay. people imagine that you can change this thing overnight. You know, I'll put an EDI lead into my trust, uh, equality diversity lead into the trust, and I expect race equality to be solved next year. It, 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 it's 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 la la land. It's not going to happen. It's going to take time, and I don't. Th I think it's going to take longer than five years, ten years to get to where we want to be. I think it. it you just when you think about the numbers that we've got at the moment, it has to take that length of time to, for all of this to to feed through. But it will happen. It will happen. It's just a matter of when. Okay. So thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. All right. Um, I was just going to say one last question. Um, this from Fiona Sampson. Um, I don't know whether Fiona, whether you, uh, whether we can get you to ask it directly. I'm sure we can. Um, and uh, yeah, Luke, if you can get oh Fiona's in anyway, that's easy. Hello. Hi Fiona. Uh, hi again, Yvonne. Um, yeah, I'm just following up kind of kind of what Jeremy uh, and Jackie have said earlier about say there's similar problems in academia. Um, but we know that there's fewer than one percent of professors are from BME backgrounds, and there's an absolute handful of female uh, BME professors, two of whom I noticed are in your talk today. So, um, but one of the problems we have is not having the data and i know that in res uh, one of the things that really focused on was getting people to declare their ethnicity and ethnicity, that yeah. staff survey so is there something i mean I, th I think there's an issue in that because the numbers are so small in some departments people don't want to declare their ethnicity because they will be identifiable um yeah. but how can we kind of encourage people to um, declare ethnicity so that we can start measuring this baseline data and then that will give us something to work on progression. I remember, I remember when, um, you know, with, with the res data and with staff surveys, we had very low numbers of people declaring their ethnicity to begin with because they thought, they worried about it. They, they didn't know what we were going to do with the data and they were worrying that it was going to be used against them and all sorts of things. I think there needs to be some sort of uh, communication out to people that actually this is, this is, this is not beat you up with this is to really help and support and make sure that we know what exactly what's going on so we can put the right interventions in um, and and slowly over years you know the numbers of people actually putting down their ethnicity in their electronic staff record and all the rest of it is, grow is growing more and more so the quality of the data is improving but that's because people have confidence that we're not going to do anything untoward with the data we're not going to you know make it difficult having said that if you have uh, fewer than, I don't know, say 15 people in your organization, then you, it's really tricky because of the, the rules around data and identifying people. So that's tricky and that's hard as well. But if people want to identify themselves, then that's, that's absolutely fine, Dandy, really. Um, but it is about people feeling confident and safe. So there's trust issues about what are people going to do with our data and, uh, you know, how are we going to manage it and, and, and so on and so forth. So. Um, there needs to be some sort of 
I don't want to call it a campaign, but you know, campaign to, to say to people, this is really, this is why we need the data to make things better so we can make robust decisions about how we make the changes that we need to make within our, within our sector, I think. Communication. There's work. Yeah. I think there's work for us to do. I think there's work for us to do together, actually. About all of this. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Yvonne. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, that, that's a nice uh, follow-on, really, uh, Yvonne, because as you may, may have gathered, this has become quite a big issue in Shah, in, in our own school. I mean, we're a microcosm yeah. of university and university. Uh, you say, if we had the data, I'm sure we'd show exactly the same issues that you're showing in the NHS. So um, we certainly plan on taking these for, things forward, and we, we'd like to follow this up in some way. We may be in touch with you uh, about that. I realize your time is scarce, and uh, you are kind of retired in some sort of shape or form but um we very much would like to uh, follow things up um so i just like to wrap up by saying giving you you know a, a big thank you uh for doing this because um it's been hugely stimulating there's been a massive amount in the chat about you know how appreciative people are and it's obviously raised right. all sorts of interesting and important issues and challenges for us uh, right. and i think it will be a great boost to our our efforts locally as well as you know more nationally so Thanks wow. again for coming. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me and I'd be more than happy to come back anytime and talk to all of you. So thank you so, so much. Really appreciate it. Thank, thank you, you John. Thank you. very much. Thank you. And normally uh, what we do at this point is go off for, for drinks, you know, and have a bit of a chat about the talk. Um, but unfortunately, we're simply not able to do that. So I'll take a rain check. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in a year's time, once one of these. In a year's time. time. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, everybody. Bye.